Hey, thank you so much for being here. I'm Kat Stefko. I'm the Director of Special Collections and Archives, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to um, the event tonight. Um, we're so, so grateful to have with us Nick Basbanes, who is an award-winning author and a bibliophile. Um, tonight is really a celebration of the book, its history, and its continued relevance in our world today. Um, over the past several months, my wonderful colleague, Marika van der Steenhoven, who is over there, um, and I have had this wonderful opportunity to delve into the college's rare book collection with the stated aim of curating the fall exhibition. Um, and that opens tonight following Nick's talk. There'll be a reception on the second floor of the library, and I hope you'll all join us for that. The aim of the exhibit is really to tell the, um, the remarkable story of the physical history of the book. Uh, as Marika and I both discovered uh, during our exploration of the collection, the book as an object is endlessly fascinating. Books tell stories well beyond their words. Typography, illustration, printing, binding, and other physical aspects of the book bear witness to human history and to our cultural, social, and economic innovations. To help us understand the broad cultural meaning of the quote unquote simple book form, one needs to understand the complexity of the history behind it. When we thought about who could help us understand this, we could not think of a better person than Nick Basbanes. Um, I really fell in love with his writing when I was working at Bates College, from which he graduated, and I won't say the year. Um, it's impossible to be at Bates, and certainly in the library, without knowing Nick's name. He's a former literary editor of the Worcester Sunday Telegram and a nationally syndicated columnist, and he's published nine books about books, about book history and about book culture. His first book, A Gentle Madness, Bibliophiles, Bibliomanes, and the Internal Passion for Books is really a classic in the field of bibliographic studies, and it remains a must read for anyone seeking to understand the passion that drives book collecting. I do offer fair warning, um, reading the book alone is enough to make you want to collect. That's what happened to me. Um, <laughs> So um, Nick's most recent book, though, is called On Paper, The Everything of Its 2,000-Year History. And that was named one of the th of three finalists for the 2014 Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Nonfiction by the American Library Association. Um, it's a natural outgrowth of his interest in book history. And the book traces paper's 2,000-year history. We are so pleased to have Nick with us here tonight to mark the opening of the fall show. His talk on materiality, a cultural consideration of paper and the book, will walk us through the interwoven and rich history of both books and paper, and I trust will provide you with, a, with an enriching context for appreciating, for appreciating the exhibit. So please join me in welcoming Nick Basbanes. Well, thank you, Kat. It's delightful to be here at Bowdoin. Kat mentioned I went to Bates, but it's more than 50 years ago, so I can be forgiven. <laughs> and I got my little pointer here. And she did mention that I've written nine books, and I just love the fact that you say this is a celebration of the book. I regard every book that I have written as a celebration of the book, but also of the book as a material object. So it just, when I heard about this exhibition and that we were able to work together, and also to come up and do some research for my next book, which I'll tell you in 20 seconds or 10 seconds, is a dual biography of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow and his wife Fanny Appleton. That will also be for Knopf. So happy to be able to be here and to do some research on Longfellow and the next book. Let me just point out, see these are the, see where it says the everything of its 2,000 year history. Uh, it really isn't everything, but it's an everything approach. And I really, I, I think that really points to the cultural uh, 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 perspective that I tried to apply to it, and also uh, the fact that uh, my, my editor at uh, Knopf, Vicki Wilson, wanted to include the fact that I'm, she said, well, are you a bibliomaniac? And I said, well, my wife certainly thinks so, but I, I, I think I'm on the cusp. So she coined a word, that, that bibliophiliac, and she put it in red. So 
You talk about the paratextual elements of a book when you're looking at things. And also notice that what I wanted to point out about the everything, it is in, it is in italics and it's all caps. So while it's not everything, it does try to be to have an everything approach. When I decided to do this book on paper, it seemed to me to be the next logical step, having written about bibliomania, bibliophilia, biblioclasm, the deliberate destruction of books, the preservation of books, having done a book on uh, reading every book its reader, putting together what I thought was a dream team of readers and writing about that. In my book, Splendor of Letters, I had two chapters on writing materials, writing surfaces through history, and that really gave rise to uh, this book on, uh, on paper. And uh, without any further ado, I just thought we'd show you the uh, paperback, the Korean edition, and the Spanish edition. There's also a Japanese and a Chinese forthcoming. I hope they all feature paper in some fashion or another uh, on the jacket. For a little bit of perspective, of course, what is a book? It's a coalescence of human intentions. Uh, that's not my definition. That's Michael Suarez, the brilliant director of Rare Book School at the University of Virginia. But I think it covers a lot of ground. A book is a container. It's a vessel, and it will always take the shape of whatever uh, materials are available and abundant. And I thought uh, we'd just do a little brief b background uh, on some of the materials that have been used through history. Now, I'm on record as saying for all of my books, all of my writing, I'll go anywhere in the world for a great story, a great book story. And it's all about narrative for me. Uh, I agree with Duke Ellington. It don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. I mean, it has to be narrative. And when I was invited in 2006 <clears throat> by the head of public affairs for the U.S. Army in, the, in Iraq, uh, in the Northern District to come and speak at the dedication of a library for soldiers. I said, I'll come in a heartbeat if you take me to the first city, if you take me to Ur, the city of Ur. And there we are, uh, and that's the Zuggerat there, the famous Zuggerat, which Leonard Woolley discovered in the 1920s. Not quite as big as the Great Pyramid uh, of Gaza, the pyramids of Egypt, but it is notable that it's, it's made from seven million bricks, an estimated seven million clay bricks with straw mud bricks, maybe another 350,000 or so fired bricks. When you look around, what do you see? You don't see any trees. You don't see any quarryable stone. So what are they going to make their books from? They're going to make it from clay. And this, I did want to show, so this is working here. Uh, when I, there was what, I was the only person, the only civilian there, by the way, in that day that I, I was, uh, uh, brought there. That's my military escort. And I just want you to see these, this, these little cuneiform writings on these ancient bricks. It looks like cement, but it's bitumen. It's 5,000 years old. First city, first writing, first books, first libraries. That's a famous uh, grave of Queen Puabi. And when that was discovered by a joint team, University of Pennsylvania and the British Museum, they, with, they uh, extracted from that cave more than 30,000 uh, clay tablets and many, many other treasures. The University of Pennsylvania has a wonderful website on the many treasures that came out of there. So I selected these four tablets only because look what you have. You have the Epic of Gilgamesh. You have the first known literary work, perhaps a thousand years older than, than, the, than Homer's Iliad and Odyssey. You have a history, the death of Sargon. You have a map of Babylon about 600 BC and you have diplomatic letters. So, so really writing, when you talk about the book, it's not, only, it's not only embracing a lot of activities and a lot of interests, but it is preserving. These are 5,000 years old. Well, I mean, the, 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 the use of clay for writing begins about 5,000 years ago in this part of the world, and, and there are thousands upon of these which, which survive. That's a Sumerian scribe with his ri a, re a, a reed stylus. It's called cuneiform from the Latin wedge-shaped. So this is where the material is dictating the form uh, that your writing system is going to develop. It's wedge-shaped. It's pliable. And when you bake it or you leave it out in the sun to dry, it'll really last literally forever. Moving along quickly, other, other materials through history. The ostraca. Oops, going back a little bit. Uh, wrong button. Uh, the pottery shards, that's where we get the word ostracism, right, from uh, the ostraca that the Greeks used. They have a, uh, one of the last undeciphered languages in the world uh, from the uh, Etruscans in Etruria. That's uh, the texts on gold foil, the Gondran texts on birch bark, palm leaf manuscripts. Uh, the uh, Chinese used tortoise shells. They also called them oracle shells because they used them for divination. And of course, in uh, Peru, they used cord. Uh, every one of these uh, uh, writing materials <clears throat> from various parts of the world 
uh, really were determined by the materials that were available. I do, do want to mention the, the wooden tablet on the bottom left, which is really the word we use today, the codex comes from a Latin word for a, a, a wooden volume. Or, uh, so really that's where wood, one particular writing surface used, more or less transferred, migrated to the next, <clears throat> to the next generation, the next uh, uh, writing surface. Moving ahead, well I went to, there I am again. I promise not too many pictures of me, but I, I did want to go to Olympia, uh, not only to see where the Olympics were founded, but I really wanted to see things that were written in stone, things that really uh, celebrated activities. Not only winners, that, that, was, uh, that temple there was uh, started by King Philip II and finished by Alexander the Great. And if you can read, a, a, if this is working ancient Greek, you can read about it and it's many of the stones that are there. Uh, you see a lot of these pedestals which honored uh, athletes. Uh, they're long gone, the statues are long gone, but their achievements are still recorded in stone. If you really wanted permanence, of course, you carved in stone. And I just couldn't resist this picture of these young students there drawing. That's the great track at Olympia, and they were sketching. So I guess it's on paper, so I can put it in there, but it's, I just lo love the picture. The Rosetta Stone, three texts. Now, all right, so we're, <clears throat> the date is very important, 196 BC. It's a, it's, a, it's a critically important text, apparently, because they carved it on stone, but you're still about 1,000 years into the era of papyrus, which we will get to shortly. But it was of such significance that it was carved on stone to form of granite. And then that's the law code of Hammurabi, same sort of thing. This stele is, uh, is at the Louvre. The, uh, by the way, the, the Rosetta Stone is the most visited monument, I understand, at the British Museum. It outdries even the Parthenon friezes. So that does kind of tell you about the magic and the wonder, the attraction that people have, the veneration that people have for the, for the written word. It's quite remarkable. Well, here's the gold standard right up until the, de until, until the introduction of paper, <coughs> papyrus. Papyrus, uh, one of the great misconceptions is that paper uh, 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 emerges from papyrus. All, all it shares is the name. Papyrus gives its name uh, to paper. Also, that it's a vegetative source and that it's pliable and you can use it. But otherwise, paper is a compound. Uh, papyrus are strips. And you can only make papyrus from the one plant, the, uh, the, the marsh reed, known as the papyrus plant, which grew in great abundance in Egypt. Now it's virtually disappeared. And you can see we have these drawings. I showed you a Sumerian scribe. Here's an Egyptian scribe. They also used a reed pen, uh, but not, not a quill pen, but a reed pen, and, 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 uh, which they dipped in ink. And of course, we scroll. You don't have your volume, but a volume was initially a, probably a 50-foot scroll. These are just magnificent. And of course, again, you have history, you have literature, you have religion, everything. Uh, that you can imagine was, was uh, written on papyrus and they, they exported it. <clears throat> the amazing thing about papyrus is that you could only make papyrus from that plant. It had to be from fresh plant, freshly harvested plants, which uh, and usually these workshops are on the banks of the Nile. So they could really use that as a bargaining chip. The Romans used it, the Greeks used it, but they had to import it from Egypt and that caused some situations. For instance, this. Now, this is, this is the last picture you see of me, but uh, 20 years ago, again, I wanted to go to one of the earliest libraries. That's John Willis Clark. I checked, by the way, you have two copies of that book in the Bowdoin Library. Magnificent book. You can get it on, on it's, a, it's public domain. You can get it online. But it's The Care of Books, and that was my, uh, my, uh, my Michelin guide when I was working on my book, Patience and Fortitude, and I was trying to do a chronological history of, of libraries. Uh, through history, and uh, I had to go to Pergamum. That's John Willis Clark's, that's his uh, actual sketch from the care of books, and I'm seated right there where that, where that, that, so that library was the great rival to Alexandria. It's the Greek library in Asia Minor on the coast, and when the, uh, and they were like Harvard and Yale, and they were looking, they were each trying to attract the greatest scholars of the day. So when, uh, Egypt, uh, the Egyptians uh, put an embargo on papyrus shipments. They came up with uh, a, a, a procedure to uh, fashion a writing surfaces out of animal skins, which, and the word Pergamum means, uh, the word parchment means from Pergamum. So we're getting close to paper in the book, aren't we? So now we've got parchment. And of course, when you go to parchment, you don't have to roll it in a scroll. Maybe you can do something else with it. So moving along. 
And of course, I have the Nag Hammadi uh, co uh, codices, the Gnostic Gospels, discovered around 300 AD, but you can see the shape of the codex. And, uh, uh, but amazingly enough, th these, were, uh, these were papyrus sheets, papyrus leaves, but they do, are taking the shape of, of the, of the uh, traditional codex. So the codex is starting to enter as a form around uh, these early centuries of the Common Era. And then, of course, we get into the era, of the age of vellum and, uh, and parchment. Parchment is from a goat or a sheep. Vellum is from a cow. You remember it, uh, it, shares, it shares a root with veal. That's one way to remember it. Uh, my wife and I went to see the Hereford Cathedral Chained Library. How precious were books. You know, when you think you, had, uh, you were going to make these uh, writing surfaces, you had to slaughter all these animals. And of course, it's, a, it's, not, a, it's not going to really be very conducive to having a great number of books and a, and a, great, uh, uh, a, a great deal of exposure and, uh, and breadth. So as you can see, books were chained. We've been to a number of chained libraries, which still are extant. So there's the Doomsday Book of 1086, right after William the Conqueror, Book of Kells. And there's a medieval scribe using his quill pen on animal skin. And now we're getting a little closer. So I've showed you things developing in Europe, but let's not forget what's going on in China. China has a, has a writing tradition that goes back 5,000 years, and for many thousands of those years, their books were on bamboo. And there's one great emperor of China, uh, his name is difficult to pronounce, so I won't try it, but he's about the third century BC, and he's the emperor who, who started construction of the Great Wall. He also is the emperor credited with, uh, with uh, um, uh, unifying China. He's supposed, supposed to be a very hands-on kind of uh, uh, leader, and he is said to have read about 120 pounds of bamboo manuscripts delivered to him every day. And this is what you talk about the burdensome and, uh, <clears throat> nature of bamboo books, but they existed in many thoughts. By the way, notice also, this is pretty cool, you know, when we talk about why, why Chinese script is vertical, north to south, why didn't it develop horizontally because of the nature of the bamboo slips, which are very narrow, and, uh, and really until just very recently where they've adapted, you can now write in both scripts. So we're getting close here to paper. Silk was too costly, but still the Chinese did do some books. A lot of their writing on silk, that's a silk fragment that, that's been preserved. And now we come to what China regards as the four great inventions of antiquity. Paper, printing, the magnetic compass, gunpowder. The top two I tend to be often, uh, Francis Bacon, for instance, recognized three of those. He didn't include paper, although he wrote about paper. <clears throat> and he didn't know where any of them came from, by the way. He thought they just sort of happened. But I, I think one of the common misconceptions is that paper and printing developed in tandem. They didn't. They were two different developments. But the Chinese do regard paper as one of their four great inventions of antiquity. And the man they credit with the invention is uh, Tsai Lung, around, uh, they, and they give you a very precise date, 105 AD, uh, although he really didn't invent it. It was probably be in development for about 200 years. They, found ex they have found examples and samples, uh, some in the, actually in the Great Wall, that date to about 150 BC. So paper was really under development for about 250 years, and I think, the idea of paper is what really attracted me, which captivated me when I started studying it. It wasn't something, it wasn't something that was inevitable. Some, there really had to be great perception and insight. Somebody really had to figure out, and Tsai Lun is the first person to articulate it. And what paper was then and what it remains today, and really why it has a universality to it, is because you can make paper from really any cellulosic material. What you need are three things, cellulosic fiber, copious amounts of fresh water and a screen mold, a sieve. What is paper? There's this, now they didn't even know this phrase, hydrogen bonding, which is, wasn't really articulated until the 20th century, but it's this remarkable uh, capacity that <coughs> cellulosic fiber has. They're called hydroxyl groups. I'm not a chemist or a scientist, but you have hydrogen atoms and oxygen atoms contained in the same little, uh, uh, it's a hydrogen group, they call it. It's a little b b boundary of a, a tiny little thing. And when you, when you beat cellulosic fiber to a, a, a vegetative material to a pulp, beating to a pulp, this is where the cliche comes in, and you uh, release these fibers and you, and you uh, swirl them in copious amounts of water, 
paper, these materials have the remarkable ability to adhere. It's called hydrogen bonding, and it's magical. And uh, so uh, Tsai Lun was the first person to articulate it. It was kind of a proprietary secret in, in China for <clears throat> perhaps 300 years. And that, and that definition hasn't changed. You can see these massive paper-making machines. They might be 600, 700 feet long, four or five stories high. They're automated these days, but still it's the same process. You are, you are uh, 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 infusing uh, a slurry of, of uh, water, um, um, maybe 95 to 98 percent water with these, with these uh, vegetative fibers, passing it through a screen as they adhere the excess water that drains out will leave a new, f a new material, a film, which we call paper. His first materials, by the way, he, this may be the first manufactured project which use re uses recycled materials. So he used the inner bark of the mulberry tree, not the same mulberry tree for the silkworm we call it today, the paper mulberry tree, but it's a, it's a cousin. Old fishnets and, uh, and old rope, which is, which, which, which is hemp. So you have three different sources which he used and which he included in the formula, but when you beat it to a pulp and you mixed it with water, that's what you got. So this is kind of the process, and I won't go through all the steps, <clears throat> but I, I, I wanted to show you this image because when I visited China for this book <clears throat> in Yunnan province, uh, there's a, 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 an indigenous people called the Naxi people, and they make this Dongba paper, and it's used as a very, it's a very long word for a kind of, of plant, but uh, it's, it has been used in China for perhaps 1,500 years for official documents. If you ingest this material, it, you, you may kill you. It's poisonous. They still use it, in fact, to uh, purge livestock of, uh, of parasites, but it makes a fabulous paper. And you can really even see the, some of the fibers in there. So this, this was printed on this Dongba paper. Uh, and these people, by the way, still have a, a, a writing, um, an alphabet. I, I hesitate to call it an alphabet because they use phonetic systems. I think it's the last uh, script in the world that still uses uh, pictographs uh, with, with the sort of alphabet. Of it, but it's quite amazing. So here we go. Here are two of your here two of the great <clears throat> the great inventions of antiquity fused into one. The the Diamond Sutra uh, recovered from a cave along the, uh, the the caves caves of a thousand Buddhas along the old Silk Road by Sir Aurel Stein. The early years of the 20th century. I think they recovered something in the order of 20,000 uh, um, paper manuscripts out of their scrolls. This one has a date on it. It precedes, and it's, a, it's printed on a with a block, a wooden carved wooden block, on paper, and and it, it predates. You'll have to do the math, but it's. 868 AD, subtract that from 1450 for the Gutenberg Bible. So that's how far ahead they were of the West. The Chinese were ahead of the, uh, the West at introducing printing. So with all that uh, as prologue, I decided when I was uh, going to write this book that I had to go to China. I wanted to see places, if it was at all possible, where paper was still being made in the same basic essential way that it was when it was invented, when it originated there 2,000 years ago. I was fortunate <clears throat> there was a group of, <clears throat> pardon me, if you forgive my allergies, <clears throat> of uh, paper historians, about eight of them from an international group, and there was a woman named Elaine Koretsky, and she was leading this group for a three-week trip to Yunnan and Sichuan provinces. And I went along as kind of the, the only civilian of the group. The rest were professional paper historians. But for three weeks, uh, we traveled along the, uh, that's the old Burma Road and the new Burma Road. If you know your World War II history, the Burma Road delivered supplies during, uh, uh, during the years of the war. Uh, uh, and then they, f they also flew over the hump of the Himalayas, those are the foothills of the Himalayas, but that's the old, that's the old Burma Road uh, down there, and that's the new one, uh, more than 3,000 mile highway uh, going from Beijing to uh, uh, Mumbai in India, and they were working on that when we went out there, and we were able still, however, as we went through this province to, uh, and of course this is where uh, so much of China's produce and vegetation has grown, so needless to say, and plus it's very, it's west, it's really west of the, uh, uh, the ma major areas of the east, and so you still will find a lot of the old ways being practiced, 
And those are two of our historians climbing those stairs, by the way. And why are we climbing up these 300 stairs? Because that's where the purest water was. You know, if you're looking for where mills or uh, little paper mills are being uh, uh, operated, you go find the water and you find the vegetation. <clears throat> and that's why we were going up that hill. This gentleman here was our guide. He was, a, uh, he was the head of the Kunming Botanical Garden. And he wanted to see, he came along, he led us. He wanted to see some of these instances where paper was being made. And of course, there are your mulberry branches. <clears throat> it's a renewable resource. You only remove these branches at the lower branches of, uh, of these trees, and you um, scoop out the inner bark, which is called bast. We'll show you some images of that. And then uh, and with that, you pound and you uh, fabricate into paper. And we, when we got to this particular site, Elaine Koretsky, who had been doing this for 40 years, she screamed, they're cooking, they're cooking, they're cooking. And all the years she'd been going, she never arrived on site when they actually happened to be cooking. A lot of these are family affairs, so they're, they're farmers and then they're paper makers. And this just represents a, such a small, I don't even think it's measurable fraction of the paper that is produced in Ch China now. It's, and, and Guan, the gentleman who is leading us, he thinks it'll be, it'll be gone within 20 or 25 years. <clears throat> but so we, <clears throat> they were cooking, they were cooking that, uh, the mulberry branches, I don't know if we can go. That looks like spaghetti, it doesn't look like pasta, but that's the bass, that's the inner bark. And uh, now this has been cooked, it's been washed, it's gonna be pounded. This gentleman was the <clears throat> ninth generation of his family. Jade Spring was down near the Bur Burma border, and he, was, uh, he couldn't speak a word of English, but we learned while we were there, he was closing his business in about two or three months, not for lack of business, but he couldn't interest his son and to follow him in the, uh, in the family trade. His son was out, in fact, working on that highway that I just showed you for good money, and so that paper business left. But there he is. And I'm, I'm told that those characters say Jade Spring. But, uh, and that's his wife. And you'll find, by the way, <clears throat> I'll have a couple more images, that as, as prestigious as this, this, uh, uh, this uh, position of paper maker is, you'll find also that their wives are doing most of the work. And, uh, and that was a perfect example of it there. And then he had these two young women working. Each one of these w women could do uh, three of these a minute. I timed them, it was one, one every 20 seconds. So you're swirling the paper. So you really want, uh, this is why handmade paper is always gonna be superior to machine-made paper, because the machine goes through and all the fibers are <clears throat> distributed in a north to south direction. When you do it by hand, you really distribute the fibers uh, in both north to south and east to west. And uh, just passing through, this is a, I noticed everybody smoked in China, by the way, even when they were making this big two-man uh, mold over here. They're making a very high-quality calligraphic paper, which they also use for <coughs> artworks. But they use paper for spirit paper. We'll get to, we have an image of that. And of course, you have to dry it. You have to remove the, uh, you have to remove the water. You dry it in multiple ways. You, you can... Uh, put it on walls like that and let it dry in the sun. They have these heated metal plates. They have uh, loft drying, but you have to, you have to uh, squeeze out the excess water and then you uh, dry it and then you have a sheet of paper. Some of the paper makers are on breaks, smoking of course. The spirit paper, very important when we talk about the grand migration of paper. This was another aspect of it that really uh, captivated me. It wasn't just the idea of paper and how it was developed and how it really changed the world, but also the way it migrated from country to country to country, and it's measurable. We know exactly when it gets to certain places and the impact that it has. One of the principal ways of transmission was, was, these, uh, was by way of these Buddhist monks. Of course, uh, Buddhism was an oral, orally transmitted religion until the introduction of paper. Paper really uh, allowed them and enabled them to really carry their, their texts, their sacred texts with them, and they taught paper making as they went. The very first place the paper, oh, actually this is, this is before we get to Korea, this woman, and I, I have trouble pronouncing her name, so I'll just leave it <coughs> uh, there, but she is China's first female paper maker, and also a, uh, a poet of some distinction. Uh, there has actually been a, a, a volume of her poetry published. And every time you see her, and this is in Chengdu, by the way, so we've gone to Yunnan province up to uh, Sichuan, and that's, a, that's a, a park named for her. That spring in the upper left is where she uh, took her water. You can see how they venerate their paper makers. <clears throat> uh, that's the spring where she drew her water for her paper. And she, she is always pictured with, I keep getting this wrong here. Uh, 
she's always pictured with this hibiscus. All of her paper had used, and, and she's always pictured when you have an image with pink paper. Uh, all of her paper had this pink tinge uh, because she used what we call as a formation aid. And so paper makers, they follow the traditional recipe, but a lot of them also have their little tricks. And there are these formation aids. It, it, can, it, it can speed up the flow of the water and give you a thinner sheet. It can slow it down, give you a thicker sheet. We've seen paper in Amalfi made with flowers, magnificent. She, put, she mixed her... Uh, uh, her pulp with hibiscus, and, 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 and it was famous for, its, for its, pink, its pink color. And then, of course, I mentioned Chengdu, well, bamboo. We use mulberry branches down in Yunnan. The, the fiber of choice up there is bamboo. It's the great inland bamboo sea. You know, the hardest thing with paper, when they were trying to find a new material, they went to wood, but wood is very difficult. It has this compound in it called lignin. That's why wood paper made from wood it was horrible for, for many, many years because of the chemicals that were used. It was brittle. And you say, well, gee, the Chinese made beautiful paper for hundreds of years from bamboo. Well, bamboo is not wood. It's a grass. So that's one of the reasons they were able to do that. And they take the young shoots moving along quickly. Connie, my wife, and I went to Korea a couple of years ago, invited to speak on the occasion of that Korean edition I showed you earlier. We were supposed to see paper making. It was one of the worst winters they ever had. Uh, but I did speak at a conference for Hanji paper, which is a magnificent paper. That hasn't changed in hundreds of years. They're still making it, and they are still <coughs> uh, uh, trying to find markets for it. I know conservators like to use it because it is very thin, but it is also very strong. Uh, and it's really a great competitor to the washi paper of the Japanese. Echizen City. So next year, the next year after that, I went to Japan. Now, after Korea, paper arrives in Japan. And, uh, and this city still has about 25 or 30 hand paper makers. It's called Paper City. And uh, you see the mountains. They have magnificent water there, mountain water, snow water, the crisp, crystal clear. So I wanted to go there to see some paper makers there. And I also wanted to visit this shrine, which is a Shinto shrine. You notice the paper at the threshold that's part of the Shinto religion. It's used at the, there's a wonderful book published uh, by a woman named Dorothy Field, Paper and Threshold, and she talks about these traditions of paper as part of this religious culture, and not just Japan, but in Asia. Paper just becomes a part of Japanese life and culture, and it still is to this day. Purity and uh, uh, this white and the symbol of purity, uh, kites, lanterns, magnificent handmade paper. So I really wanted to go there. But that is the shrine of the goddess of paper making. And there she is, Kawakami Gozen. And uh, she's a local deity. And the tradition holds that around 600 AD, and that's when paper making is believed to have come to Korea. And this particular city faces, is on the Sea of Japan facing Korea. Uh, she is said to have taught these farmers how to make paper. And she's still, they still bring her down from the mountain once or twice a year. When I was there, that's the litter that they carry her around. And I didn't climb the mountain to see her. <clears throat> but these images will do. So there's two reasons to go, the, the city, the goddess. But really, I went there to see, the, the, as I said, the, uh, the uh, traditions, all the techniques you saw in the Japanese paper making, Chinese paper making, Jap uh, Japanese is really the same. But there, I really wanted to interview this man. Ichibe Iwano the Ninth, a living national treasure and son of Ichibe Iwano the Eighth, who was Japan's first living national treasure. He's now 84 years old, and his paper is said to be the world, the world standard. He doesn't speak any English, but we had translators. We spent a delightful day today, uh, that day together. And here he is on his, uh, and that's his son, who will be Ichibe the Tenth. When he, when he succeeds him. And it's very important. You only get the name Ichibe in this family if you agree to follow the master as a paper maker. So it may not be, it doesn't have to be your son, it could be a nephew, it could be a, a second son, but the one who agrees to learn will be the one who will be the next Ichibe. And there they are, on the, both of them on their hands and knees, going through that fiber, picking out specks of bark just to make sure the paper is of exceptional purity. And there he is. And there's his wife making the paper. She was making all the paper the day I was there. So his paper, which has his stamp on it, I believe so much of it is being made by his wife. And he took me into the area where he dried the paper. And he said to the interpreter, here, tear it. Want to see, we want to see how strong it is. I wouldn't do it. I said, I can't, I can't do that to this beautiful sheet. So he tore it. But I want you to see that little fiber. Again, I keep hitting the wrong button right there. 
why is Japanese paper considered so strong and why is it used by conservatives because of its, 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 its exceptional strength and its exceptional thinness and it's magnificent for calligraphy and writing and so moving he gave me that little sheet of paper with his writing it says the joy of living in paper and these are other studios where they were making paper and uh, the Japanese by the way get credit <clears throat> they have gotten credit for the first print with, with it's the diamond suture is the first book but the first known printed object is this Dharami and it was and it was printed in one million copies by the Empress uh, Shotoku is her name and uh, she had survived a, an apparent coup she had survived an illness and as, as a gesture of thanksgiving she ordered one million of these prayers produced each one to be spooled and, and inserted in these uh, three-tiered pagodas and many of them survive. I've handled three of them, including this one. Uh, uh, two of them are in the collections of private, uh, private collectors, and one is at the, well, the one I saw was at UCLA, another one. And so they survive. But you know, when you say it's the first, but then the Koreans will tell you, well, we have one that's actually a little early, but it doesn't, and that's the one up there. And then, of course, uh, we talk about Gutenberg uh, inventing pr uh, printing by movable type. Metal type. Well, the Koreans actually have a book they call the Jikji. It's at the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. It only exists in this one fragmentary copy, but it was printed with movable metal type. So things are going on all over the world. And when you say something's the first, it's, you know, be, be very careful. This is from Dard Hunter, paper making, the classic. You also have that in the Bowdoin collections I checked. It's in the science department. Very interesting. If you really want to know about <clears throat> the spread of paper through history from country to country, that is the book. And really that book is also published by Knopf, my publisher. It really liberated me to do the cultural aspects because if you want to see paper and the spread of paper making, country to country, the techniques they use, there's Dard Hunter right there. And he actually made that, uh, he, he, he made that statue that's in the Crane Museum in Western Mass. You go to that book. Now we go and <clears throat> we've gone to, through Korea and Japan, now moving on the other side, the great event that really will bring paper to Europe happens actually in, in, the, uh, uh, in the Near East. There's a, uh, uh, a, a tri actually Central Asia, there's a, a tribal war going on between the Abbasid Caliphate and the Tang Dynasty. The uh, 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 Arab forces are victorious. It's at the Battle of Talis River, it's, uh, 751 AD. <clears throat> so many, many Chinese are taken prisoner in exchange for their lives. They teach, they teach the uh, Arabs the craft of paper making. I really want you to notice up top this here. That's a stamper. What the Arabs really introduce to paper making is rags, and that will really become the standard in Europe. Why not? It's cotton rags. There's pl plenty of linen there, plenty of cotton, and 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 they discovered that if you pulp it, it's going to do the same thing. It's going to make a sheet of paper. All the other steps are the same. And there are very few illustrations. Actually, this is one of the few I actually had to buy. I had to uh, uh, get a license for from the British Library because they really weren't very good about documenting their craft. This is a Kashmiri manuscript from the 19th century, but it pretty well shows you that the, the uh, <coughs> procedures that they were using. And you see, and Damascus became a center of paper making. Baghdad became a center of paper making. Syria, the uh, the um, in Egypt, the first mill in Egypt is uh, opens in, in about 950 A.D. It just spreads, and Damascus is really the uh, the uh, focal point of paper going into Europe. But it isn't. And, it, and look look at how magnificent Quranic uh, calligraphy is. You know, uh, printing printing was illegal in the Ottoman Empire for 300 years, up until 1743, because, because calligraphy became a very high uh, uh, art to be skilled and to be admired, and it was, and it was to propagate uh, the Koran. So it was illegal. A lot of, a lot of scholars will, will argue maybe this is one of the reasons why the balance shifted. You had the great golden era of, of, <coughs> of, of uh, of the, of the caliphates in, in, in Arabia and then Europe when printing was introduced. It was up, really, it was 300 years and, uh, and one of the reasons was opposition from the clergy. You had the scribal service. And by the way, the Ottomans introduced the first bureaucracy and they really were able to do this because they had so much paper. Paper becomes one of the mediums of government for the Ottoman Empire. I have this one up there because North Africa, 11th century, <coughs> it's a codex, it's on paper. And it is really through North Africa, uh, 
where paper is introduced to Spain in the 10th century, and from Spain it's going to travel to Italy very quickly. Maybe the Italians actually think they had it first. Either way, it would have been brought there by, by Arabic, peop uh, Arabic paper makers, and then it just travels throughout Europe in a very quick, very rapid manner. Now this is from the Nuremberg Chronicle. You have a facsimile of that in special collections, one of 300, so if you want to take a look at the original Nuremberg Chronicle, which is an incutable, right, one of the books printed in the infancy of printing in the first 50 years. And that's actually one of the, uh, it's, there are maybe 1,200 of those books that survive. But what you're looking at is the city of Nuremberg as it appeared about 1390. So this is the paper mill of Ullmann Stroma right down here, and that's the inset. And that's the first paper mill that comes to Germany. And if you look at the date, it's about 40 or 50 years before Gutenberg starts to develop his printing press, which changes everything. Elizabeth Eisenstein, that's another book you have to read, and you have multiple copies here. Uh, the printing press is an agent of change, and how really the world changes in almost in a heartbeat. Within 50 years from the introduction <coughs> of print, she estimates anywhere from eight, well, she estimates eight million volumes were printed in the first 50 years. Other uh, historians of the Histoire du Livre suggest it might be as many as 20 million books printed when paper was introduced and when the printing press, uh, when the pr printing press was old. I have this William Scheide, he has a whole chapter to himself <clears throat> in my book, A Journal Madness. He was said to be, I believe, he was the greatest, he was the greatest living book collector while he was alive. He passed away a few years ago. He not only owned the, the Gutenberg Bible, the 42-line Bible, he also had the 36-line Gutenberg, all, all known imprints of Gutenberg. There were about six of them. He had all of those. He had the first four Bibles printed on paper. It was a remarkable collection. And when I went to visit him, he sat me down at a table. <clears throat> he went to this safe and he brought out this box. I said, let me help you. He told me to sit. And then he opened it. And, I, and if you listen to my tape of this uh, uh, interview, he says, are you okay? <clears throat> and, and I can be heard muttering, forgive me, sir, I'm a bit lightheaded. <laughs> and I, because I really wasn't expecting him to open his Gutenberg Bible and to invite me to touch where metal type bit into paper for the first time. And if you want to know the definition of a bibliomaniac, that's kind of comes close when you have this it's not just the tactility, I mean, it's, it's everything. And he just knew that book. Anyway, he's a great, great collector. And his entire collection went to Princeton University, which now has it. These, <clears throat> so we talk about rare books, scarce books. The first folio is not all that rare, but it, you know, there may be 200 of them survive. There are 80 alone at the Folger Shakespeare Library, where I handled these two. But without paper, without the printed book, we don't have Shakespeare. We don't have a single, I mean, we may have eight or nine examples of his signature. We don't have any manuscripts. Everything we get of Shakespeare comes by way of the printed book. So I thought if I'm going to put up a couple of books, I'd put up the Gutenberg Bible and the first folio. Now, because Dard Hunter gives you the history of paper making, I'm going to go very quickly through it, but I just want to show you how it was illustrated in Europe. So the first uh, it's a, a book of trades by Jostaban, 1568, and everything is very accurate there. Look at the stampers. The only thing that is really difficult to believe is the, is the boy carrying that poster paper. That's impossible. But everything else is pretty accurate. That's Vittoria Zonka. He's actually showing you the operation of the stamper. And we move along a few of the others. These are all very early illustrations. And this is a famous book. This is the first book that really, in Europe that really discusses paper making. Uh, it's, it's, uh, these are illustrations that were in there. We get to Diderot. He has perhaps 20 or 30 illustrations in his, in, uh, his encyclopedia, and they're very detailed. And uh, this one in particular on the right is the Hollander Beater, invented by the Dutch, 1680, 1690. That changes that whole procedure for stamping, for uh, uh, what's called stamping, and which is pounding this, this, these, <coughs> these materials into a pulp. And it was designed to operate from wind power, but later modified for water power. And, and really, the beaters today are still essentially Hollander beaters. That hasn't changed much at all. So printing comes to British North America 
1640, that's the whole book of Psalms, the base Psalm book, that's the copy that was sold a couple of years ago. It was, a, it was a duplicate copy in the Prince Collection of the Boston Public Library. I happen to hold that one. And uh, it's in terrible shape. Why would somebody pay $15 million for it? You know, what is the power of a piece of paper, really? Again, I maintain that paper is the only manufactured project, that, pro, uh, 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 object that gets value strictly by the intellectual construct that you put on it. Somebody would pay $15 million for really what is badly decaying paper, but it happens to be the first book printed in North America. Now, the first paper mill doesn't come to North America until 1690, Rittenhouse in uh, Philadelphia. It's the only place where you will find this. North America is really the only place that you will find this, where printing precedes the paper. Here, here it was uh, uh, where paper precedes the print printing. Here it was printing that came first because the British were running things and they were, had embargoes on the paper. And really, there wasn't a literary tradition of being established here anyway. So everything worked out fine. But when we say that's the first book, the Spanish and, and Mexico beat us, beat, beat, beat uh, uh, British North America by maybe a hundred years. The John Carter Brown Library in Providence alone has something like 65, perhaps 70 examples of pre, uh, 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 of the, that first hundred years of printing prior to the base um, book. Now I gave a talk at the, Mex at the uh, uh, Mexico National Library and I had these slides in there and I discussed that middle one. 1565. It's magnificent. It's red, red ink, black ink. And after my talk, they took me in this room and they said, well, here it is. It's the only surviving cup. Another one of those moments, you know, where you say, wow. And here are a few others. This is uh, one of 12 million paper documents at the Massachusetts Historical Society. Uh, Peter Drummy, the director, told me this is his favorite. And of course, Massachusetts Historical Society is the first historical society <clears throat> in the United States, well before the uh, 1791, I believe it is. And uh, Jeremy Bellman, he was the man that sat down John Hancock, said, tell me about that uh, midnight ride. He's the guy who said he would, he would go through a dung heap if there's a, ch if there's a prize at the bottom. He was looking for paper, paper that would document this whole experience. This one is Peter's favorite. It's, it's uh, signed by William Bradford, who is the governor of Plymouth. He's writing a letter, letter to uh, John Winthrop, who is the governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Again, 1638, so a good 40 or 50 years before this paper, so it's imported. Pa paper is very precious, and it's a letter of some substance. Anne Hutchinson, a border dispute, all these things. What makes it Peter's favorite is the fact that you see two different handwriting uh, uh, hands on there, Bradford's, and because paper was so scarce, uh, Winthrop crafts his, he drafts his response on the same sheet of paper. So it's kind of cool. So both of them are on, are on that sheet of paper. These are stamps, Stamp Act. <clears throat> I maintain, well, it's pretty obvious. Uh, this, this is the run-up to the American Revolution. What was the Stamp Act all about? It was all about taxing the many ways that paper had become indispensable in our daily lives. There's 50 or so duties and levies that had to be paid. On, if it was a marriage certificate, a death certificate, or if you wanted to be a lawyer to get your license, a deed for a property. And of course, one of the, the fatal flaw of that was that they taxed the newspapers. Arthur Schlesinger Sr. says it would have worked if you didn't tax the newspapers. And here's the day, uh, his Halloween, the day before it was supposed to go into effect, expiring. They were going to stop printing. And of course, it never went into effect. This is the Gunwad Bible, another chapter in my book. I talk about cartridge paper, which really changes the whole texture of warfare. And during the revolution, this is the third edition, Christopher Sauer, Christopher Sauer, by the way, <clears throat> he pre-printed the first book, the first edition of this book, printed in North America on paper made in America. But these were unbound copies uh, before the Battle of Germantown. They were seized by the British troops and used to make, uh, make cartridge paper, so they call it the gunwad paper. Then we get America's birth certificate on paper. It precedes the engrossed one on parchment, on, on vellum, because that was done over a period of weeks. The night of July the 4th, John Dunlop's uh, printing press sent out about 200 of these. The first one in Massachusetts, Maine was part of Massachusetts, then was read by the great Isaiah Thomas in Worcester, and then it spread throughout the land by way of this paper document. Jacob Christian Schaefer, but source, again, we're working with rags. This is a very famous book, very scarce. These are Dard Hunter's copies. I handled the ones at Harvard, too. 
Basically, the long German title is Ways of Making Paper Without Rags. And he, he did experiments with 80 different plants, and he had samples of every one tipped in. But really, what we're talking about is because paper is becoming very scarce and very desirable, people are trying to find another way to make, make it besides, and here's, a, here's a, a, an announcement from the Crane Paper Company. Ladies, save your rags. <laughs> and the same year, you have a man named Matthias Koops in England who, who prints this book on paper made from straw. And you can see it's yellow. I handled this one at the Houghton Library, 200 years old. And when you opened it, it smelled like fresh cut grass. It was amazing. He actually made paper for two years. Uh, it, it didn't succeed. Here are images of rag pickers. This is how, this is how paper was made. We really were reliant on rags coming in. They were, and especially during the years of the American Civil War. Here's another Harper's Weekly. These are rag pickers selling their wares. And of course, we get to wood. And uh, that changes everything, doesn't it? Uh, we have, we have uh, unlimited forests here. Well, not really, but uh, <clears throat> that changes. Uh, every, that's, that's the uh, Glatfelter plant in uh, Spring Grove, Pennsylvania. I wanted to go there because it's a vertical. It's, uh, I really wanted to see paper making where the trees came in one end and paper went out the other. And they claim to make paper for 1,000 different commercial uses. Postage stamps, Hallmark cards, every imaginable thing. And that's where it starts. And that Ford Reiner machine, that's the, what we call the first paper making machine, that dates to 1880 and that's still running. They were, they were making paper for postage stamps when we were there. There was moving along. And of course we have printed ephemera, ephemera and materials that are printed and not expected to last. But when they do, they become very, very interesting and very important. That's the famous Honus Wagner card, the Wayne Gretzky card, two and a half million dollars. That's the first appearance of Superman. Over $3 million, of the newsstand price was 10 cents. Do the math. This is a very wonderful collection of ephemera at the Winterthur Museum, uh, brought together by a couple of the Grossmans. 250,000 uh, chromolithographs from two, covering 200 years, the first Valentine, the first Christmas card. Really quite lovely. There's the British Guiana stamp, 1857. One shilling sold for $10 million. There it is. And then you're looking at, a, I, I, I paid maybe a buck for that Zimbabwe 100 trillion note. So again, what's paper worth? It's only worth what we think it's worth, what we say it's worth. We made a wonderful paper, but then they just finally, they went to the American dollar, thankfully. So it's 100 trillion dollars. Bob Dylan, he does uh, his hotel stationery, that sold at a sale for two million. Uh, Ken Rendell has a magnificent World War II museum. He's a bookseller in Natick, Mass. If you have a chance to see it. And it's, he really has everything. But he has at the middle of it a safe with these uh, <clears throat> paper documents. And he brought this one out and he handed it to me. And that's uh, the draft copy of the Munich Agreement. That's Hitler's, Adolf Hitler's handwriting. Oh, I did that. <laughs> Sorry about that. There, that's Neville Chamberlain there. And what Ken said is what you were holding in your hands is the document that started World War II. Makes you stop to think about what a piece of paper could do. There's a, a sketch. That's the most money ever spent for a single sheet of paper. And actually, there were two drawings, and they both pay, sold for pretty much the same thing. I have a chapter on paper as an instrument of the creative process. And, and really, Leonardo da Vinci, maybe 20 paintings survived. None of his architectural work survives, really, in situ. His, uh, but we, he, we know him and what he did and his genius through many thousands of drawings. He was the son of a notary, and he always had paper everywhere he went. And tell me this is not just a tool. I, I think it's beyond that. I think it becomes a part of the creative process, all of this thinking that's going on in these various drawings. And you can say the very same thing about <coughs> Beethoven, who really uh, went everywhere with notebooks. I think there are 3,500 uh, surviving examples. We saw Thomas Edison's, and he kept um, over 3,000 notebooks. I like these two. The light bulb, which actually the first successful light bulb used a, a piece of uh, carbonized uh, paper filament, then they went to bamboo. The very first uh, recording device in the upper right used uh, paper with paraffin on it, it was wax paper. So really Edison was not only using paper to, to work out his, uh, his inventions, but he was using it really in his inventions. Jacques Carré went to the Parthenon a few years before Lord Elgin removed the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the great friezes and took them, to, uh, took them to London and before the Venetians bombed it and really left it. So if you really, uh, left it at the hulk that it is today, if you really want to see what the Parthenon looked like in its glory, you have to go 
And these are uh, Bibliothèque Nationale, they have the originals, magnificent. And you can say the same thing about old St. Paul's Cathedral, William Dugdale, who was encouraged to go out and write about this, these, these great uh, uh, churches that were falling in disrepair. He got Wenceslas Holler to do some illustrations. Eight years after the book is published, St. Paul's Cathedral is burned to the ground, so if you want to know what it looked like, you have to go to that book on paper. And then I also uh, <clears throat> pay a great deal of attention to architecture and engineering, and how engineering really becomes this cousin of architecture. You will not have the Industrial Revolution, in my view, without paper, without b blueprints. I mean, is it possible to make these? These blueprints are from the uh, Thomas Edison Library, and you see the various. Can you make a steam engine? Can you make a, a locomotive without various uh, work groups working precisely on the same page to v uh, very exacting details without copies, of, without uh, uh, precisely rendered drawings? So I, I, say, I just argue that paper is so essential to the whole, to the whole uh, exercise. I'm from Lowell, Massachusetts. Lowell was really built uh, in the early 1800s. Engineers, these wonderful drawings survived at the Lowell National Historical Park. The French made the first uh, fly, uh, object to carry humans aloft. The Montgolfier brothers were uh, members of a family that uh, were a very distinguished paper-making family, and their first balloon had five layers of laminated paper on it. So there it is, Bibliothèque Nationale. And of course, what is photography? Writing with light. You know, all right, so we're using light, we're preserving images, but all the great images, and these are all public domain, Library of Congress. You talk about iconic images, Paper. The first computers, paper cards, right? And so we're winding it up, but uh, ticker, you really will never see a ticker tape parade again as they used to be because there's no more ticker tape. You know, but the ticker tape machine was the first, was the first actually computerized printing device, electronic printing device, and it used copious amounts of paper. This is John Glenn, and it was a day of celebration. And I use that to segue into what is the final chapter of my book, which I call Elegy and Fragments. Every one of my books starts with an image, or ends with an image, but the image that really drove this above all others was watching those, seeing those two twin towers collapse that day. All that massive amount of uh, paperwork that, that was uh, expelled from these buildings, and they were the, really the only artifacts of any consequence to survive. So I wondered, what, what, were we able to find anything out about this? Did people actually go out and archive? You'll have to read the book to see uh, what I discovered on that. But I just did want to show you a couple of images. Just where's the paper was everywhere. This one really captured me, this Larry Towell photograph. But I will, and this is a, a Mark Shamming from the uh, New York State Museum. They were looking for paper examples at the Fishkills uh, landfill of paper materials that they could bring back. But I'm going to end with two, two images. I will give you two. Pablo Ortiz, if you Google him, he worked for the World Trade Center, he survived. He worked to help more than 100 people escape. He died with another man, they were working together. That night, this <clears throat> business card that you see, it floated across the Hudson River and it came to rest on a windowsill in Brooklyn. And it's now at the 9-11 Museum. You talk about leaving your, co your calling card. And he is really one of the great unsung heroes because we know what the firefighters and the police did, the great sacrifice. But this was a civilian who worked to save people, and this is one of the legacies that he left. Well, then when I, <clears throat> I started going down to the World Trade Center, uh, when they were actually planning the, the facility and the museum and the holdings, and the woman, Jan Ramirez, who was curating it, she slid this sheet of paper across. Totally authentic, I mean, it, it's, uh, the provenance is impeccable. In, in brief, a woman who was escaping the, 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 uh, the South Tower at the World Trade Center, this piece of paper floated down to her feet. She picked it up. She looked at it. She fled the scene. She handed it over to a guard at the uh, 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 National Bank, the Reserve Bank. He looked at it and looked up, and the tower collapsed. And all it says, what it says is 84th floor, west office, 12 people trapped. That was ground zero for that United Airlines flight. Everyone was presumed to have died up there, but apparently 12 people survived. But who were they? So did this, this piece of paper would speak for all the victims if it had to. But when I was there, I asked Jan, I said, what's, what's, this, what's this over here? You know, what's, what's this smudge? And she said, well, that's blood. And I said, well, this is the 21st century. Can we get some DNA out of that? And she said, we're going to work on it, but there are still 37,000 fragments or so that have priority. 
And this was in 2008, 2009. And then when I was finalizing the book, getting it ready to go off to the publisher, I called her, got in touch. And I said, by the way, anything, silence. She said, we got a hit. And the woman whose husband died of the accident prefers to remain anonymous, which I understood. Then a week later, she called. She said, well, Denise Scott is happy to talk to you. And I have to tell you, it was the most harrowing interview I've done out of the hundreds that I've done in my life. Because she said she had three young daughters. She said, there's no closure. That word closure doesn't help you. We all assumed Randy had died instantly. But now we found out he lived for an hour. But she, and the children want to know, did he suffer? And she said, no, he didn't suffer. Look, he fought to the end. He was trying to save people. And if you look at the cut line, the, ca the caption in the bottom, it's a collection of the family of Randolph Scott with permission of the museum. Because she said, that is our most precious possession. That's his legacy. So it's on permanent loan to the 9-11 Museum. But this piece of common bond paper basically has no other value except for what's on it. And when you think in particular that it's not ink, it's blood and DNA that takes 10 years to deliver its message. It's a pretty powerful statement about paper, materiality, the book, and what really is a book in our society. So that's it. And I, I guess I went four minutes over, but I've got plenty of time to take some questions. And thank you all very much for coming. It's very nice to see you. So, any questions? Oh, okay, start back here. I grew up in Worcester, and as a kid, there used to be um, rag men that would come around the streets uh, with a raggedy old horse and a, and a cart behind it. And they'd haul a rags, <laughs> and they must have been collecting for the paper industry. The other thing I have to comment on is in Fairhaven, Vermont, a man named James Lyon, son of Matthew Lyon, a congressman, <coughs> supposedly uh, printed uh, and made the first pulp paper in the United States. Mm -hmm. And it was used for a newspaper issue. Yeah, actually, I think it was done in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, in fact. So I, th I think that's right, actually. Fairhaven, Vermont. It's not far from Worcester. Fairhaven, Vermont. Oh, it's Vermont. Vermont, I'm sorry. Well, the first pulp, I thought, was in, but that could very well be, yeah. Great, great, uh, thanks. Anyone else? Um, I'm not, correct me if I'm wrong, did you, meant, did you say something like the invention of paper wasn't inevitable? I say it was not inevitable. What do you, can you elaborate? Yeah, a because it's, uh, it's a process. It's, I mean, I think you're right. You can carve something on stone. That's pretty straightforward. You've got mud, and you can make a clay tablet. You don't have to come up with a concoction and a formula. The idea that you can take any cellulosic, any vegetative matter, anything that has cellulosic fiber, and that you can pound that into a pulp. So you have to pound it into a pulp and release these fibers, and then mix it with copious amounts of water, and then screen it through a sieve. I mean, this, this is not inevitable. This, this takes intelligence and perception. And that's why the Chinese are actually able to keep it as a proprietary secret for 300 years and why it became a very dear, a very dear skill when passed on to the, to the Arabs in the six, uh, whatever it is, the 8th the century. So I, believe, I mean, others might argue differently, but I think it really takes, it takes a, an evolutionary step to, uh, to, to see things and to perceive things and put them together and say, Eureka, I've got it. You know, and how they came up with the idea, nobody knows. Maybe they saw coagulating uh, um, masses of vegetative matter in a, in a stream. And somebody said, well, you know what? Maybe we can do, I don't know. But that's, that's my take on it. Yes. Fantastic lecture. Well, thank you. So you've talked so much about Sorry. You've talked so much about the history of paper, and I'm, I'm really curious to know what are your thoughts or visions of the future of paper in 10 years, in 100 years? Yeah, paper. Okay, well, paper and the book are two different things. I wrote an op-ed for the LA Times, and, I, and, the, and the, the subject was the myth of the paperless society. Because as I said, the a group of British paper historians estimate there are 20,000 20, identifiable commercial uses of paper. 
So I think newspapers are going to go away. I mean, we can see that now. I mean, really, you get your news. Uh, and so that's, that, that's inevitable. The printed book, I think the printed book survives. I think uh, the Librarian of Congress, the former Librarian of Congress, he thought that, that, that the digital book would really allow the paper book to would liberate the paper book to really achieve its full potential as a creative medium. And I, I like to think that way. I, I'm very pleased, by the way, that there was a digital edition, there is a digital edition of my book on paper, which seems kind of counterintuitive, <laughs> but, uh, but I really would not be happy if it weren't on paper, <laughs> if there weren't a paper edition. Uh, paper will survive, and uh, I'm pleased to see that the newspapers that are published today, are printed today, are on largely recycled material, so recycling. Uh, well, there was a, a, a famous historian of libraries named Jesse Scherer. He was asked that very same question in the 1960s. And he said, the likelihood of a, he said, a paperless society, the likelihood of a, a paperless society is as likely as a paperless bathroom. And, uh, and, and, and really, and if you own stock in uh, Kimberly Clark and International Paper, they're doing very well. And really, it's that particular line of, uh, I have a chapter on that I call one and done, by the way, in, the, in, the, in my book. Thanks for the question. Anyone else? Th thanks again for a fabulous talk. Um, you touched briefly on the um, revolution of bringing wood into the paper making process. Yes. I wondered if you could just elaborate a little bit on the, uh, the larger um, significance of that for the paper industry. I hadn't well, actually quite just, it, realized how recent it okay. was. Well, the answer to that is that Maybe the segue from the rags to the wood wasn't clear enough, but uh, just as the Egyptians put an embargo on, on, on uh, papyrus, as these paper-making countries uh, needed more paper, they were embargoes on rags, especially during the American Civil War. Um, uh, and actually, what I failed to mention, there was a paper maker up here in Maine by the name, by the name of Alexander Stanwood and Gardner, what is that, 40, 50 miles from here? And it's been documented, people denied it for the longest time, but he actually brought three, two or three uh, cargo ships from Egypt here with mummies, Egyptian mummies, that, because they were there by the thousands, and they, were, and they actually uh, stripped them of their linen wrappings and made a, a low quality paper. But, uh, and actually there was an outbreak of cholera that was attendant with that, so it was, but, but it just gives you some idea of how desperate people were for a new fiber source. Finally, when you were able to, I mean, you, you could always make paper from wood, but there's this lignin, this lignin compound that's in there. It's like a resin, and it makes for a very bad, acidic paper. You see newspapers that yellow, or they put chemicals in. And when you hear about how smelly many paper mills are or used to be, it's not the paper, it's the chemicals and the, the various things that are being used. So there were a lot of hurdles that had to be, uh, had to be uh, jumped over, but, but once they were able to do that, you had an inexhaustible supply of, uh, of, of, of vegetative matter and here in North America, and that really leads directly to the United States of America becoming the world's leading producer of paper. I don't know if they still hold that distinction, but they certainly were, they're certainly a major player. But it was really the, the availability suddenly overnight of an inexhaustible supply source of the basic material to make it, and that changed everything. And then the newspapers, the rotary press came in, so you had newspapers, it wasn't just books, it was really you're able to make paper for so many different things. So, you know, it's a curse on the one hand because we know what it's done to the forests and uh, we're hoping that the Chinese, by the way, they destroyed all their forests during the Great Leap Forward. And they, most, all of their paper virtually is made from wood, but they have to import it. They actually have these huge container ships to go to South America. Eucalyptus trees are a good source because they grow quickly, they have plantations, and it makes a fairly decent uh, uh, pulp paper. And they, they ship these to China by the shipload, and they actually ship it so that to really maximize the cargo. They actually ship it on site at the docks in South America and bring it to China. But it's, it's, a, it's a pretty evident that once that supply was available, it would change the whole industry. Yes? When you were speaking about the Rosetta Stone, you mentioned. Um, you have to, could you speak up just a bit? Sure. Please? When you were speaking about the Rosetta Stone, you mentioned something about one of the few remaining undeciphered texts. And I've always been curious what the process is like when you find something written on paper in an ancient language or inscribed on rock in an ancient language that 
is no longer spoken? I mean, how do you go about studying? Well, the, let's, let's never mind the, uh, the Etruscan language because, that's still, because they don't have enough text. They, don't, uh, they know some of the letters, but with, with, say, the Rosetta Stone, you had the hieroglyphics on the top, you had the demotic, which was the vernacular Egyptian in the middle, and the Greek, which was known on the bottom, and they're all, re they're all stating the same exact text. So knowing the Greek, knowing something of the demotic, then Champollion, who worked with paper copies, by the way, you know, the, the, when the Rosetta Stone went to England, it was, it was uh, recovered by the French, there were, uh, 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 there were hostilities going on, and, and the only way he could actually see those hieroglyphics where they actually used it as a printing block. So that, and it was in reverse, so they had to make uh, reverse copies. But his, his decipherment was made possible by those copies. But I think it was you have to have something to compare it with. Oh, you need a lot of examples. You need a lot of material so that you can find common points. With the, with the Etruscan, there just isn't that much. This, another great undeciphered language, <clears throat> pardon me, is linear A from Crete. It just isn't enough, and so they're still working on it. But, uh, too, I'm sure there are others, but but I think you need a lot of material, and it really helps to have a parallel text, one that you know that you can then, because you know these words, so you can kind of figure out what these words are by that. You just it's it's just a deconstruction of of, of and that's how Champollion did it. Yes. Uh, so this isn't on paper, the material specifically, but why is the codex the standard form of the book nowadays? <clears throat> well, um, again, pap papyrus was a lamination, and you scrolled it. And that's why really, you know, you scroll. As a, and that's why the, I mentioned Chinese being written north to south, these other, because you're scrolling this now, and you're scrolling it from one spool to, well, that was awkward. But then, mainly, the main, the main reason it is, when you went from papyrus to parchment, or vellum, which is from animal skins, you really weren't able to glue them together the way you would have the papyrus. So it just occasioned a different material structure. I think it was really, it was functionality and it was ease. So when you see the books, the earliest books on, on, on animal skins, I mean, they're a thousand years older than the first paper books, but they re, may retain that same shape. Also, very significant, <clears throat> paper was amazing, not only because you could make it anywhere, you could make it from any vegetative source, but think about what it is. It's cheap, you can fold it, that's very important, it's tough. So you can take one piece of paper, fold it in half, you got four pages, right? Fold it another time, you got eight. Fold it again, you got 16 pages, you got a choir. You can't do that with papyrus, and so that, but that more or less dictates the shape of the codex. And it's still, obviously, it's still very useful in, in that way, but I, th I think it's a matter of function, determining the shape, and it still retains that. Uh, thank you for the question. So uh, thank, oh, you thank you so much for coming. <clears throat> and uh, before we, before I let you go, I'm just gonna a couple public service announcements. Um, please join us at the library on the second floor for a reception. There's a cake and it's shaped like a book, so um, you have to come and see that. And then I just wanted to give a nod to our good friends at the Art Museum. Um, they are having a talk tomorrow night that's called Appreciating Paper, Art's Best Supporting Actor. So that's going to be really continuing the theme we started here today. That will be a conservator and a curator looking at how artists have employed paper to support their work. So thank you so much for being here. It's been a real oh, pleasure. I love it.